Rebecca, how many more do we need? We are at 19 last time I checked, but I, I haven't seen anyone else new yet. Uh, Rami just joined, so make that 20. Rebecca, We're good to go. That... Okay. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Give me a sec. All right. So welcome everybody to the December full board meeting of Community Board 8. Before we start, um, I do want to make a quick announcement. I want to welcome our newest member of Community Board 8, Paul Crickler, who was just appointed earlier this week. So we're very, very excited to have him. And uh, he's certainly no stranger to Bore, he's been very active uh, just as a member of the public for a long time. So um, welcome, Paul. We're very, very happy to have you. And I hope everybody will uh, take some time, reach out to Paul if you don't know him uh, over the next few weeks and, and uh, get to know him and, and make him feel welcome. So with that, um, we are about to get into the <clears throat> public session. I'll just remind folks that you have until 6.45 p.m. If you wanna speak in the public session, you have to sign up through the website. So you can still do that up until 6.45. So if you do, just go back to uh, <clears throat> the CBM website where you had uh, logged in and, um, and do that. So with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to Will to go over the, uh, the Zoom processes. Thank you, and uh, allow me to join welcoming Paul to the board. Um, so first off, if this is your first time joining us for one of these meetings, you'll notice that you're muted and you're going to stay muted throughout the duration of the meeting. 
Uh, the only time that we will be unmuting anybody uh, is if you've signed up for the public session. So as we move to the public session, we're gonna ask if you have signed up uh, to just be on the lookout for your name to be called. And whenever your name is called, you can help us find you by going to the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen and pressing the raise hand button. It's not the thumbs up or the wave, those will uh, not help us as much, but if you hit the raise hand button, uh, we'll be able to find you and we'll unmute you. If you're calling in from the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. And just as I said, uh, whenever Russell calls your name and we unmute, we ask you to be unmuted, just be on the lookout for a prompt asking you to confirm unmuting so that uh, you can speak. If you're having any problems and you're here and your name is called, uh, use the uh, chat for technical support. The, the chat is only available for technical support. It is not to ask questions or make comments on any of the items brought up today during the meeting. So we just ask that you, if you're having a problem with uh, Zoom, use the chat, otherwise um, leave it alone. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Russell and he can get things started. Oh, and I guess there, everybody in the public session will have two minutes to speak and you'll see a timer on your screen whenever Russell has you start. That's right, and Will is very strict with the timer. Okay, so um, let's go to the public session and we will start with Alita Camp. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I just wanted to talk for a minute about, or my two minutes, about propane heaters, because I understand that there's legislation potentially pending at the City Council, sponsored, I believe, by Keith Powers, our one of our local council members, who um, has not come before the community board to discuss it. Propane heaters in enclosed outdoor restaurant spaces um, cause a lot of health and safety issues. The health issues are that they release carbon dioxide and in an enclosed space, like a lot of these outdoor restaurant structures, uh, there's not enough ventilation to prevent the buildup of carbon dioxide. I did some research on this. There is, the use, the safety use is supposed to be four hours maximum. They're supplemental heaters, not intended to be the primary heater of a space. We don't know how safe or unsafe these are in public spaces. There's also a significant fire risk in some place, I'm not sure where exactly, styrofoam ceiling titles were ignited by the heat from these propane heaters. There is a real fire risk um, if it's not installed, operated and maintained properly. And who exactly is going to enforce the proper installation, operation and maintenance of propane heaters? On Lexington and 84th Street last winter, I found three untended um, propane heater canisters just waiting to be picked up, I suppose, with the trash because they were next to the trash can. So I'm asking, um, I'm concerned about the health and safety risks. It wasn't properly pr or presented at all to the community board, and there's no time for the Environment and Sanitation Committee to weigh in because I think it's coming for a vote in January. So if you're as concerned as I am about the safety issues, please call your local council member and ask them to hold off on a vote or to vote no until the real risks are asked ascertained and understood better. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, and I'm a member of CB8, but speaking on my own behalf. So I should have said that from the very beginning, but thank you everyone for your um, patience. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Matt Bauer from the Madison Avenue Bid. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I just a uh, couple of things. I wanna give a quick update about what's happening here on the Avenue. Um, you know, last year we were having meetings with the Small Business Committee uh, about what we could do to help uh, small businesses. And one of the suggestions that a lot of the committee members were coming up with uh, was to do a shopper loyalty program uh, for, uh, for our district. And uh, it took a long time, uh, but we finally uh, got it uh, up and running. The program is called Madison Avenue Now. And you can see we have over 40 stores that are participating uh, and uh, that you can get the app that provides all the information about the program on Google Play and on the Apple App Store. Once again, just search for Madison Avenue now. I really wanna say thanks to Alita and Gail Barron and Barry Schneider and Valerie Mason, Michael Malefi, actually who all helped in trying to push us to get this thing going. So really thank you for that. Also, uh, I wanna say we have a bunch of new businesses that have opened up on Madison Avenue in the last few uh, weeks. 
you know, AG Jeans at 1009 Madison Avenue, and Mashburn is open to pop up at 846 Madison, a Bogner for ski wear. Uh, at 755 Madison Avenue, uh, Garen at 1070 has jewelry and uh, um, apparel. Uh, uh, tomorrow, officially La Maison Valmont opens up at the uh, Carlisle Hotel, which is going to be a spa and skincare uh, business. And actually, later this week, Ruben and Chappelle is going to open up at 964 Madison Avenue, right at 76th Street, a wonderful uh, uh, two New York uh, fashion designers that are opening up their first new store since uh, for many years. So thanks so much. Wish you all a great holiday and uh, be well. Thank you. Uh, next, let's go to Liz Daly from Rick. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Liz Daly. I'm the Community Relations Manager for the Frick Collection. Um, as many of you know, we've been in our temporary home, uh, Frick Madison, since March. Um, it's located at 75th Street and Madison Avenue in the Royal Building, which you may have remember as the old Whitney. Um, and one of the great things about being in a building like that is that it affords us a new way of looking at our collection. So in that vein, in, on September 30th, we opened an exciting year-long project called Living Histories, Queer Views and Old Masters um, that presents contemporary paintings by New York-based artists in conversation with works at the Frick. And there, um, there's a particular emphasis on issues of um, gender and queer identity that are typically absent from narratives of European art. So I just want to let you know that there is still time to see the first installation uh, of this series. Uh, it features paintings by Salman Tour and Dora Weinberg, and it will be on view on the second floor well into January of 2022. Um, in general, Frick Madison is open uh, Thursday through Sundays from 10 to 6. And don't forget while you're there to go downstairs and visit Joe Coffee, where you can get, yes, coffee but also pastries, sandwiches, and some salads. Um, I should add that on New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve, we're open only until three o'clock and we will, we will be closed on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So uh, please visit our website, uh, www.frick.org. And um, I hope that you'll come visit us at Frick Madison and I wish you all very happy and healthy holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, let's go to CD8 member uh, Michelle Brimbaugh. Thank you, Russell. I'll be very brief. Um, it's come to my attention that there is a proposal to change the zoning uh, as it pertains to having music, live music in restaurants. And there is a very strict zoning code with limitations on the square footage, the amount of musicians that can be present at any given time relative to the size, etc. I don't know much about it and I don't know much about the proposal. However, it's my understanding and I don't know if a representative of Keith Powers is here tonight, but it's my understanding that he's proposing such a thing. And if so, I would like to ask him to please come before us to talk to us about this bill and to get some input from us. So I hope this message gets to him via this public session. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next let's go to Evelyn David. Good, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for doing this again. Okay, so my um, question and my worry and my concern is congestion pricing. It continues to be. I am not dropping this at all. I was on the MTA call. There were four of us speaking, and I'm like, uh-oh, people are getting a little tired, but don't get tired because they're, you know, they're not getting tired. So what I'm going, what I'm asking for and requesting is that in your resolution, and this was suggested to me by um, actually your state senator, 
um, in that office, that in the resolution, in your resolution, you request that the, the, the congestion line be below 60th Street due to the fact that the main hubs for water, gas, electricity, Verizon, Spectrum, et cetera, are located on 61st Street and partly on 60th Street and partly on Lex. Okay, so it's under constant construction, and it's uh, um, right now it isn't, but when it is, it's completely shut down. So that forces traffic onto 60th Street, um, and then we'd be in the congestion zone. So if it's below 60th, at least we could go to 60th. So number two, if the line is not below 60th, it cuts off 15 parking spaces, another worry, on Park Avenue between 60th and 61st. Residents go south on Lex. They make a right-hand turn on 60th Street, and then they make a right on Park when you're looking for parking. I don't know if any of you do this, but I do this, and we're all of us constantly, and we're really worried about it, as well as all the doormen are. Anyway, um, you know, as far as everything else goes, thank you very much for everything and all the work that you do. I don't know how you do this. I have gone back to work teaching, and it is huge job, obviously, but anyway, it's just, but what you do is just actually miraculous. So I hope that in your resolution, at least you can ask for this. In, Thank you. Right. right I mean, if it goes to the MTA. Thank you. Next, we will go to Maureen Casey. I'm sorry, repeat that name. Maureen Casey. Go ahead, Maureen. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I've been attending the uh, community board meeting sessions for, I guess, for the past couple of months, and I just want to commend you all for the dedication that you have to the neighborhood. And my question this evening is about the uh, relocation of the restaurant Cafe del des Artis, um, del Sass, I'm sorry, um, to up the street. But what I read in the New York Post this week is that this was in the works for several years because the former location of the restaurant is scheduled to be torn down. So I was just wondering if the board knows anything about the development of that property or what's going to be happening at that location of 2nd Avenue and 88th Street. Thank you. Thanks, we can uh, inquire further and uh, follow up with you. Next, let's go to Andrew Ravishir. Hi, Russell. Thank you for letting me speak. And I'm wishing everyone at CBA a happy, healthy new year and a happy holiday season. Uh, I'm a member of the general public. And normally I talk about the environmental need for a 210 foot height cap. And I'll circle back to that in a bit. But I really just want to talk about uh, coming together and building coalitions for the greater good and for the good of our neighborhood overall, uh, specifically with regard to climate change. Uh, this weekend, New York One had an article about uh, two companies, Radiator Labs and Runwise, and they are focusing on buildings reducing their energy consumption and costs. And the Clean Fight is a state nonprofit organization that's helping these companies scale up their operations. As we are becoming more aware of the disastrous effects of climate change, not just in the existential uh, realm, but also in terms of our personal lives, our personal health care, I would really welcome if CB8 asked these communities to come to these meetings, to come into our neighborhoods, to help us decarbonize our buildings and lower our carbon uh, pollution. I, I think that'd be a really great partnership that we could seek out in the new year. Uh, also with regard to air quality, Governor Hochul said that she wants New York to be the air quality monitoring capital uh, of the country. Great, I really would love to welcome her into our neighborhood. I'm, I'm smelling the mildew again on 2nd Avenue and 83rd where they're taking down big daddies. And as there's more and more construction, there's gonna be more and more air pollution. And it's something that we know about kind of through our lived experience, but we don't have a quantitative measure. The closest air monitoring place uh, is actually in the East Village, which is very different. So with that in mind, and with regarding the 210 foot height cap, I know a lot of us felt the sting of the blood center or Longfellow expansion being approved and our neighborhood being uh, unfairly maligned. It's time to look for ways to build partnerships that's not only gonna help our neighborhood, but that's gonna help us all and for us to be of service to the whole city as well. Thank you and again, happy holidays. Thank you. All right, next, let us move to the uh, next item on the agenda. That's it for the public session. So 
next is the adoption of the agenda of the agenda. Is there a motion to do that? You can do it with a uh, thumbs up. Yep. And a second. Rebecca uh, Rebecca. and Elizabeth. Great. Okay. And we're opposed to that. Terrific. Next, we will adopt the last meeting's minutes. Uh, so with a thumbs up, you can make a motion. All right. See what Lou's doing that. 30 seconds. So anyone opposed to that? No, great. Barry, is your hand up because you no, need to clarify? Just... No, okay, great. And then, uh, okay, um, I assume Gail will be joining us later. Let me check with Isabel. Isabel? Well, uh, hi, good evening, everybody. Sorry, I'm <laughs> doing two things at a time. Uh, uh, so the board president is going to join us later. I will advise Will when she is ready to join and she will deliver the report herself. Okay. All right, so now let's move to the elected official reports. And we will start with Audrey Tanner from the Scooter's office. Hey. Hi everyone. Um, just a few things. Uh, one, first and foremost, Liz wants you to know that on the agenda for January 10th, when the session resumes in Albany, is the open meetings law. So it seems very likely that it's going to be extended. Uh, everyone seems to be understanding that it really should be. So I just wanted to reassure you all that's on the agenda. Two other things. One is the New York State Homeowners Assistance Program. Please know there are a lot of people in our district we know who have fallen behind because of loss of income during the COVID and uh, in the, either in their mortgage or in their maintenance costs. And this is a grant program that New York State has funded through the federal government to help people with grants, uh, to help them with the arrears of mortgage or maintenance. And the application process is opening on January 3rd. So please, we'll send all the details to Will once we have them. Also know that on January 6th, Senator Kruger will be hosting a virtual town hall. She'll have the DHCR administrator, Danny Levy, who's responsible for this program, as well as Rosemary Cantano, a lawyer from NILAG, who will be helping people file the application. So please know about this program and about this form of assistance for our neighbors. The other co-op, uh, benefit for folks is the, the reverse mortgage for seniors living in co-ops. This is legislation that finally passed. Governor Hochul signed it. We know there are a lot of seniors on fixed incomes in our district who have been really eager for this bill to be signed. So it will go into effect in May. Again, help us spread the word. As we have details, we'll share them with Will, and we will certainly be having town halls on that. That's it. Happy holidays. Peace, love, joy, health, happiness. All good in 2022. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Rebecca Grigas from Game Plus Office. Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Sorry I've been missing for a few months. I've started law school part-time, so I've not been able to join, but I'm very happy to see you all this evening. Like Audrey said, session is going to start in a few weeks, and very much like Senator Kruger, Assemblymember Court is going to definitely be focusing on the open meetings law. He's in support of several bills that would extend or make virtual meetings permanent uh, in, in the law. So hopefully that comes up as soon as possible and we will make sure we'll update our constituents on that. Um, also for the eviction moratorium, which is also set to expire on the same day as the open meetings law extension. We do not know at this moment of any plans to extend it or have it end at that time. I'm sure as the days approach, it will be up discussion. And like I said, with the um, open meetings law, we will inform constituents as soon as possible. And we have a lot of folks reaching out to help them check on their ERAP applications. I know there is a concern about people not getting the funds. We will do whatever we can to get an update on your application. So if someone lives in our district, we'd be happy to send their info over to the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance who monitor the program and ask for an update. And if there's anything else anyone needs assistance with, I will put my contact information in the chat. And that is all that I have. I hope everyone has a lovely holiday and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, next let's go to Terrell Brock, Senator Strong's office. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Terrell Brock, and I'm a community liaison for my state senator, Jose Serrano's office. As many of you know, Senator Serrano is the chair of the Cultural Affairs Committee in the Senate and advocated for historic $100 million for nonprofit arts support through our state budget this year. The New York State Council on the Arts has been releasing the, the funding in the rounds over the last few months. The capital funding ap application for the New York State Council of the Arts is open and, and will assist uh, organizations facing health and safety issues in their spaces and venues, taking into account COVID guidelines, among other needs. Any New York State nonprofit arts and culture organizations is encouraged to, to apply. Applicants must be pre-qualified by the uh, uh, application deadline on January 14th. You can reach out to our office for more information. And, and uh, as we approach the holidays, if any organizations need PPE for food distribution or, or, or any uh, other events, please feel free to contact our office. It, like uh, our number is 212-828-5829. And you can also email us at serrano that uh, nysenate.gov. And I also like to uh, thank uh, I, I like to thank uh, Sandra Coleman at at, at Hartshog and Lita Clamp for the uh, great work I've seen them do in um, in the Sally Isaacs community. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, like all, all, all over their time invested to us. And, and I hope everybody have a happy holidays and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Courtney Ferrissey from Rebecca Sirius office. Good evening, I'm Courtney Ferrissey representing New York State Assembly member Rebecca Seawright. Assembly member Seawright would like to wish you all a happy and healthy holidays and to share a few updates from her work in Albany and in our community. On International Human Rights Day, Assembly Member C. Wright was on Roosevelt Island for the unveiling of the Girl Puzzle Monument honoring Nellie Bly at Lighthouse Park. Uh, she secured a Roosevelt Island testing site to ensure that Roosevelt Islanders have safe and happy holidays. The van returns next week with vaccinations and testing from December 20th to the 24th. Uh, together with over 30 of her colleagues in the assembly, uh, Seawright called upon the SUNY Board of Trustees to terminate the chancellorship of James Malatris and to appoint an interim replacement until a national search can be conducted. Uh, the following day, the chancellor resigned, effective January 14th. Seawright uh, joined PSIS 217 school community on Roosevelt Island to cut the ribbon on their new STEM learning hub and green roof. Additionally, she broke ground on the PS 151 Yorkville Community School rooftop play space. Uh, our office invites you to join us for some holiday cheer this Monday, December 20th from 2 to 4 p.m. Additionally, we're co uh, collecting uh, toys, books, and board games for children in the community. Uh, so please consider dropping off a new unwrapped gift for our collection uh, at our office. Um, 1485 York Avenue between 78th and 79th streets. Um, as always, please consider us a resource. Uh, you can reach us at 212-288-4607 or by email at crightr at nyassembly.gov. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that does it for the elected official reports. Uh, for now, and then um, let's go into the chair's report. So I already mentioned um, the uh, big news about fall joining, uh, which again is very exciting. I didn't want to get scooped. Uh, I waited until the chair report and didn't announce it at the very beginning. Um, I want to recognize last week we had our uh, now uh, second annual uh, CB8 trivia uh, holiday extravaganza. Uh, which was great. Um, so I just want to thank Vanessa Aronson again for putting that together. She did a really, really good job, as did Will, um, who helped out. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So thanks to uh, the board members and others who joined. And um, that is it for my report. Will. All right. I'll. I'll be quick. I just wish everybody happy holidays and happy new year. 
Um, I did want to give you guys a quick little statistical uh, update. Um, so this is the last meeting we're going to have in 2021. And all total from January till now, we had 145 CB8 meetings that were hosted on Zoom that reached hundreds and thousands of our neighbors. And if you add that to the 81 virtual meetings we had since the beginning of the pandemic, we've hosted 226 virtual committee and full board meetings and public uh, events for our neighborhood. So you guys all deserve a big round of applause for, for how engaged this neighborhood is, because I think it's got to be the highest in, in, in at least Manhattan. So uh, that's really all I had for my report. Just wish everybody a happy and healthy and safe holiday season. Thank you very much. And I wanna echo that happy holidays to everybody. Um, all right, so with that, I think we can move into the committee reports. So we will start with the Landmarks Committee. David, just go ahead and unmute. You hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you, Russell. Uh, Jane can't be with us tonight. Uh, we had two applications. Um, <clears throat> the uh, first one, uh, 980 uh, Park Avenue, and uh, Saida, is Saida there to put on the uh, slides? Yeah, I can do that. Just give me you one You can second. do that, okay. First one, you can go back. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is the parish house uh, and uh, it used to have a very large stoop. That stoop has been gone for a very long time. Uh, it has a pair of black doors with uh, uh, some uh, glazing in the upper portions uh, and the uh, intent is to replace those doors and also to uh, add an awning uh, as far as the doors go, if you could show the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is to use a wine colored doors uh, to make it much more open in feeling, uh, to make it easier for uh, accessibility for the handicapped. Uh, there is a forecourt, small forecourt before the doors uh, so that there is room uh, for uh, wheelchair to move around. Uh, the forecourt is reached by a ramp from the east and also by a few steps down uh, from the street. Uh, the uh, committee felt very positively about uh, the design of the doors being much more welcoming and inviting and transparent, which is what the pastor apparently was looking for. So this uh, was um, uh, a resolution uh, that uh, had all the members in favor. Uh, so I guess uh, I need a resolution on this, uh, hopefully uh, positively. Can somebody um, make a hook? Rita, Barry? go ahead. Barry? Barry? Move to approve. Okay, and we have a, obviously a lot of seconds. Paul, so, uh, call the question. And uh, any opposed? All in favor, call the roll. Okay, so this is for Landmarks 1A. Correct. If you'd like to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. A yes means you, you, uh, you approve. I see a virtual hand from Lori, but let's try and use the participants. Can we unmute Lori? Yeah, I'm trying. Hi, uh, I'm not voting for cause just because I work at St. Ignatius. Seeing no other hands, uh, the resolution passes 42 to zero to zero to one, not voting for cause. Okay, so <clears throat> we can go back to that slide. 
Uh, the next part is the awning. And uh, Will, if we could get the slide back. Uh, should the, see now, right? Yeah, thank you. The intent was to uh, create an awning that uh, felt comfortable with all the other awnings on Park Avenue or all the other canopies on Park Avenue. Uh, we felt that this awning didn't feel comfortable with the building. And it was not a particularly attractive awning in and of itself. Uh, and uh, this was uh, disapproved seven to one uh, with two public members also in favor of the disapproval. So uh, I think I need a resolution on this, please. I think we can just call the question because it's the same. Call the question. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, all in favor? Michelle has, so Michelle has her hand up. Rita has her hand up. Um, yeah, no, sorry. I, I was going to make an additional comment, but if the if the question has been, I don't called, think it has been called, then I'll let it be. I don't think it has been. So you, your hand is up. Oh, you don't think it has been? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I no, I was going to add that in addition to it being inappropriate, both in design and it's inappropriate in placement. It's oversized. It's eight feet by eight feet. The brass poles aren't appropriate. And um, as a matter of fact, even in our uh, almost unanimous approval or unanimous approval of the door, we recommended, although it wasn't part of our consideration, uh, our vote, we recommended that the door plate either be removed or be in black. But the awning is completely out of scale it doesn't belong in that space. And just to remind everybody that we heartily approved the handicapped access ramp that is servicing this entrance in the past so that it is accessible, the door is welcoming, the canopy is very obtrusive and out of place. Thank you. So I think uh, Elizabeth Rose is the next. I guess I have a question uh, for the committee, which is, is there an awning that you would approve here? An awning serves a very functional purpose. It's why many residential buildings have them. And I, it sounds like the church would like an awning to serve a functional purpose. So my question is, is your intent in disapproving the awning that you just don't like this awning and and but that you would like other awnings or are you saying there should not be any awning here at all <clears throat> when we make a resolution it's with respect to the particular application uh, with respect to this application we think the awning is inappropriate that doesn't mean that the architects couldn't come back with another awning now, as a practical matter, uh, this building is set back from the street. Uh, so this awning, which is totally on their property, uh, means that you can't get out of a cab or get out of a car and have protection. You have to get across the sidewalk and under the awning. And there is a vestibule inside. And in fact, uh, they created a new, a new vestibule and added a second door to do that. So it is true that they would like the awning for further protection, but it's uh, it's an easy transition without the awning and you're not gonna be protected on the sidewalk uh, the way you are with a lot of the awnings uh, along Park Avenue. With all that said, our approach is to look at the particular application. There is nothing to prevent them from coming back and convincing us that uh, yeah, there is an awning or there is a canopy that would be appropriate. Thank you. Alita and then Lori Boris. Thank you. Um, I just want to point out, I walked by the church this afternoon and the building itself is very distinctive on Park Avenue. The part with the door juts out a little bit from the rest of it, which is set back. Um, so an awning feels as though it would be particularly out of place given the geometry of the building and the particular style. It's also a complex of buildings that wraps from 83rd Street halfway down between Park and Madison 
across, I'm sorry, 84th Street, halfway down from Park and Madison, across Park Avenue to 83rd Street, and then back down almost to Madison Avenue with numerous entrances, some of which have, um, I think, fairly deep awnings or at least protection. So there are other ways into the complex, but this building itself is, is very striking and very unusual, both the color of the stone and the style of it. It would be disruptive by having that awning on um, in the middle of Park Avenue. Thank you. Lori has her hand up and then Billy. Lori. Yes, um, well, again, I'm not gonna be voting on this because uh, I work for the church, but um, the uh, but the awning, and I spend a lot of time in this building, and um, it seems to me that the awning would be very helpful for uh, the for accessibility purposes um, because people would, um, come from the side in a wheelchair and then they would be under an awning while um, they were dealing with the door. Uh, so um, I would urge you to vote for it because I do think that a, um, an awning serves the purpose of um, making it uh, more accessible to the handicapped. Uh, but again, I won't be voting because um, I work for the church. Thank you. Only response to that is that we did not vote against an awning. Uh, we understand all the reasons why an awning could be helpful. This awning is simply inappropriate in the judgment of the committee. It doesn't mean they can't come back to us with another design that we might find appropriate. So why put in the wrong awning if they can come back with a better design? Billy, and then Elaine Walsh. Yeah, I tend to try to defer to the committee on things like this, and I probably will do that here, but I just wanted to clarify, what was the reason they're seeking the awning is my first question. And then second, um, was there discussion at the meeting uh, as to what type of awning um, we'd like to see? I know this is kind of a question Elizabeth Rose was asking, but did they respond in the meeting in any way to what you may have felt, David, would be a more appropriate awning for the building? We don't try to redesign in these meetings. We simply evaluate what we're seeing. Sometimes there are design suggestions that are made, but uh, they tend to be rare. Uh, it's not simple to design an awning and uh, to just shoot from the hip, uh, I don't think is the answer. Uh, yes, the pastor would like the awning and that's what they told us. Uh, so we certainly want you to be aware of that. However, we feel that the awning is not appropriate, the one that has been designed, and we're not saying that they can't come back. They've, you know, very often we have uh, disapprovals, then the architects come back and they do something which is a lot better and we approve it. So if the pastor feels strongly enough and he wants Atchison Thornton Doyle to come back, they the architects, uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't come back with a with another design. The truth be known, uh, I think that uh, in the discussion we had, uh, they were um, not very uh, strong in trying to defend their awning. Uh, and in fact, the presenter said that uh, he told the pastor that this awning might not in fact find favor. So uh, I think they knew they were coming in with something that was marginal from an aesthetic point of view, even though from a practical point of view, uh, it makes a lot of sense. So what we're hoping is that uh, they can come back, meet the pastor's requirement of having protection, but have it done in a way that is appropriate to the building. And uh, I don't wanna give you my design ideas, but I think there are ways to make an awning that is appropriate. Yeah. I, I think if my, my take on this real quick is just, you know, let's support the, the committee um, in trying to have, I guess, some somewhat of an iterative process to get a better result. But I hope this doesn't become many back and forths where we're never satisfied with an awning. I'd like to see them eventually get an approval here. So Billy, thank you. the truth be known, you know, if you look at the history of, of this committee, 
we've had uh, disapprovals, they come back, they do a much better job, and we give them an approval. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, if all goes well from the point of view of uh, providing the functionality that this awning will provide, uh, and if somebody can also come back and give us the aesthetic that's appropriate to this building, and then we get a happy marriage and it gets approved. Uh, and we do not get into backs and forths. The worst situation I can remember is someone, someone coming back a third time. But they understood each time that uh, when we commented that our comments had merit and they responded positively. And then we finally got uh, some really good uh, results. So I think that uh, not only does the committee uh, do the job uh, of reviewing, but the committee actually does a good job in helping some of these applicants come up with much better solutions. Yep, I agree. That's why I'll be voting to support your resolution. Thank you, David. Welcome. Elaine is the next person with their hand. Yeah, go ahead, Elaine. You can unmute. Thank you. Uh, just two points uh, I think uh, Billy asked, one of the ones I was going to ask, just to make sure that they were told they can come back with other options, my first point. The, the second is, I just want to clarify that that rectory um, is part of the church. As you go around the corner, those are re um, Loyola High School, and that goes almost three quarters up. And then there's another kind of building for Jesuit um, activity and um, things that belong to the church. So the rectory does not go all the way around, nor does the church. Um, they're two separate entities on that other side. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, Elaine, Atchison Doyle is one of the leading firms with respect to uh, preservation. Uh, they've been doing this for 40 years, maybe more. They've been to us very, very often. And uh, Mick Doyle, who is the senior partner there, is fully familiar with the process and fully understands that uh, he can come back. We have on occasion with first timers reminded them that they can come back. Didn't think it was necessary with Mick Doyle. Uh, next, you have Chuck Warren. Go ahead, Chuck. You can unmute. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'd like to call a question. Let me clear those hands. Billy, do you want to take this one? Yep. All right. So, folks, if you are, um, this is this is on landmarks resolution one B on the awning. Um, it was a disapproval. If you are voting um, no, abstaining or not voting for cause, please raise your hand. All right, I see a few hands up. Let's start with uh, Lori. Well, I'm assuming you're not voting for cause again. Lori, just say, say it out loud for the record, please. Yes, that is correct. I am not voting for cause. Great, thank you, Lori. Peter Patch is up next. No. Thank you, Peter. Next, Elizabeth Rose. No, and I recommend that they look at 315 East 68th Street for an example of a residential yeah, just, Sorry, Elizabeth, we're just gonna... um, Sharon Pope Marshall. No. Thank you, Sharon. May. Um, sorry, just to be clear, this is a vote in support or against? I was the one dissenting <clears throat> vote on the committee. This is a disapproval. It's the same, it's the same resolution that was in the committee. Okay. So I, if, it's, if you dissent, yeah. I, I approved in the committee and I'd like to... I, I'm just confused. I, I'm, I'm um, for the proposal um, as so, so you want to vote that? That means you'd be a no vote on Great. this disapproval. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, May. Thanks, Billy. Do we have any other hands? Anyone else wanting to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause? 
I saw another hand up and it went down. I don't know who it was. I, it, it was it was Sandrea's hand, yeah. but it's down now, so I'm not sure whether. Make sure. Andrea, um, did you mean to have your hand up? I just know she loses service sometimes. Okay. All set? I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I changed my mind. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrea. Okay. I'm um, seeing no other hands. I'll go tally the votes. <clears throat> and we can now go on to the Delacorte Theater. A second application. <clears throat> and Will, if I could ask you to put on the first slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> the Delacorte Theater uh, has undergone a number of renovations over its long history. Uh, all of those renovations have been respect respectful of the original design concept. And um, all of those renovations have, uh, in some sense, uh, improved the functionality and the aesthetics. Uh, what we're seeing here uh, in the large uh, uh, rendering uh, is what the Delacorte Theater could look like. And what you're seeing in the lower right-hand corner is what the theater looks like today. What's happened with the theater is that uh, <clears throat> they've kept the footprint, but you can see that there is a slight canting and by canting the wall outwards, both the upper wall and the lower wall, uh, it provides more room, more functionality. Uh, and uh, you'll see that uh, as we go through some of the uh, other images. Uh, it also, as you can see, uh, provides much greater sense of theatricality and uh, the fun of being in theater, going to theater. And I think you can also see that uh, uh, there are a lot of pluses with respect to the signage. So uh, we'll probably maybe hit some of these again because uh, it's a big project and I, normal, and I normally try to minimize the slides, but I think we have a half a dozen slides this time. Uh, so uh, what's important is that uh, we'll show you later on a comparison of in-season and out-of-season because the idea is that this place also has to be safely locked up and still look good out of season as well as in season. Uh, so you'll see that uh, as we go through it. Uh, last but not least, more as uh, again an introduction, not one tree is being disturbed. Uh, uh, the uh, setting uh, is not going to change, uh, but, we but they have in fact extended the uh, what I'll call the, the marquee, uh, where you see the large name, and they have, of course, canted it, and they have also extended the area in front. Uh, they are working with an arborist so that uh, anything they do uh, will be uh, done only uh, with respect to the major trees that are there. So, in effect, uh, it is maintaining the natural surroundings, and in fact, as you'll see, it is actually trying to become even one with the natural surroundings. Uh, so we can see the next slide, please. One of the things they've been, well, no, out of order, but uh, this gives you uh, maybe an idea of what's happening at night. And maybe I'm missing a slide because maybe we missed, misled our, our numbers. But in effect, uh, here you're seeing a little bit more of it at night. Uh, and uh, you know, I would only have basically the same messages. What's happening at night is that uh, uh, you're downlighting, but that downlighting is strictly uh, for the area around the theater. And we're uplighting again to uh, 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 just create a, a greater presence uh, by uplighting the upper wall, but it's not in any way uh, adding light uh, in any substantive way into the nature that surrounds the theater. Next one. <clears throat> They've been very, very cognizant of uh, ADA requirements. Right now, there is only one ramp on the left-hand side, and that ramp uh, only provides seating uh, in the front row. 
Uh, what they now have are ramps on both sides, and they have double ramps so that uh, you now have seating in the front row, and you also have seating in the cross aisle. Uh, so this is accommodating um, uh, people in wheelchairs uh, in a very much improved way. Uh, whenever we look at a project, we look at it not only from the aesthetics, uh, but the appropriateness with respect to uh, how people are going to uh, use and enjoy the space. We could see the next, please. <clears throat> this gives you a sense of the on-season and off-season. On the left-hand side is on-season, and you can see uh, the signage and uh, uh, the celebration of theater. And on the right-hand side, you see the off-season, uh, even the um, concession booths or ticket booths uh, wind up being closed, not only with windows and shutters, uh, but with wood panels that match uh, the wood paneling uh, that is uh, the new wood paneling or the new sheathing for the theater. And one of the things I should say, and maybe it comes across here a little bit also, uh, the sheathing on all the prior uh, theaters, although it's been cedar, it's been flat, so it's been an appropriate wood uh, for weathering. Uh, this is uh, cedar that is in fact uh, constantly changing depths so that what you get is a play of light shadow. And again, the idea is to try to pick up some of the idea of the dappling of the trees and the way uh, the light and shadow works uh, with the um, striated, uh, with the striated siding. Next. <clears throat> There are four individual light towers and one double light tower. Uh, right now, these individual light towers are a little bit dangerous. Uh, so they have new designs with uh, larger platforms at the top, uh, safer access. Uh, the uh, light towers are 60 foot, two and a half inches tall. The double tower and two of the four towers, all the towers will be 60 foot, two and a half inches tall uh, as part of this project. Here again, these light towers are strictly to light within the theater. Uh, they are not to light uh, the surroundings. Uh, next, please. The, it's a little hard to see in these slides. However, I think you get the sense when you look uh, at the left-hand slide, the right and the center slide in particular, um, <clears throat> that what they're doing with the seats uh, is using colors from nature uh, and having multicolored seats and then having these seats uh, in some sense uh, blend with the surrounding. In the summer, of course, it's hard to see from a distance, but they've been very sensitive uh, in the way they've thought about the coloration and the seating. It's not primary colors, uh, it's nature's colors. Next. Well, I'm missing the last slide, but uh, the last slide uh, is similar to the front slide, the first slide that you saw, uh, and um, it's a far better nighttime slide than the one that was uh, put in, uh, but I think you get the message. Uh, we thought this was extremely well designed uh, aesthetically. Uh, it's uh, changes to some extent. Uh, the uh, the, um, some of the aspects with respect both to functionality and aesthetics. Uh, the other side of the coin is the history is that all of the interventions have changed this slightly, have improved it slightly each time. And this is very much in the tradition of not being a pure restoration, but in fact being uh, a restoration and a renovation that uh, improves both aesthetically and functionally uh, the theater. So this was a, uh, this was a unanimous approval and uh, I think it speaks for itself. We have hands from Rita, Barry and Rebecca Dangor. Go ahead, Rita. Make a motion to approve. Motions on the first, you can just call the question section. Call the question. Rebecca, second.
And there's a second. Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is called. Yep, if you would like to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Chuck? Chuck Warren. Voting, I'm not voting for cause because my firm's been representing the Delacorte uh, on matters related to this. I'll give everyone two more seconds. Seeing none, the resolution passes by a vote of 43 to zero to zero to one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, before we go to the next uh, committee <clears throat> report, we're gonna briefly hear from <clears throat> two more elected official representatives. So first we'll go to Philip Ellison from the Public Advocates Office. Go ahead, Philip, you can unmute. Sorry, I didn't change my name. Thank you for flagging Will. I'll be super brief. Um, happy holidays to everyone from the public and myself. Uh, I know you've been, uh, you know, uh, in about the blood center and so forth and paying attention and, you know, we're, we're hoping that the final vote. Um, I just wanted to two two updates as we go into the new year. Uh, the public advocates office was uh, used uh, video as a medium. I'll share a link, but really looking at, you know, thinking about um, some of the marginalized in the city, particularly the trans uh, community and access to healthcare and the obstacles for transgendered New Yorkers. We, we did release um, a video uh, highlighting that the piece was entitled Our Healthcare, featuring a roundtable discussion between the members of the Office of the Public Advocate and a panel of transgender activities. And so as we're walking through the world and, you know, and, um, you know, in, in ways that other people with um, identities don't have the same access we do or have different challenges we may not think of, I, I, I you know, urge folks to take a second and um, take a look at the, the, the video and conversation. Um, so I'll make sure I post that. And lastly, um, yeah, this week, uh, the city council uh, will vote on Thursday afternoon on public advocate Jermani Williams' nomination of te tenants' rights attorney Leah Goodbridge, uh, manager attorney for mobilizing for just mobilization for justice, excuse me, to serve on the city planning commission. This allows for um, follows a unanimous committee vote to approve the nomination um, uh, last week, excuse me, and so forth. So those are just outside of comments about indoor masking and the the announcement of the next NYPD commissioner and balancing safety and um, uh, kind of cultural change in the department. Uh, we um, wish you well. And I'll make a post and leave my information so in the new year, if uh, CBA needs anything, uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Uh, you'll also hear from Ben Jacobs from Council on Power Service. Hi. Yes, I, I will also be brief and I will, I'm sure I'll be done before the two minutes are up, but I, I'm Ben from Councilman Powers office. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, I, 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 that is, I, I tested negative just the other day, but I do have a cough, so excuse me for that. Um, but uh, <coughs> the, today was the last day of the, the legislative session for the city council. Uh, they had their last day of the meeting a few hours ago, so that all, uh, uh, th that went through. The Councilman Powers is proud to have a uh, number of his, his bills passed. One of the bills that he had passed today was a, uh, it requires executive orders to be from the mayor to be posted online within one, day, one business day, uh, which is of course an improvement. Um, all the bills will be reintroduced in January at the start of the next city council session in a couple weeks. Um, for curbside composting, uh, I'm sure everyone here has been trying to keep track of that, but the sanitation department is rolling out the curbside composting by community board according to uh, need and request. So uh, if your building has or hasn't signed up for curbside composting, you can do that at the at the DSNY website. Uh, now, based on the density of CB8 from our discussions with DSNY, I would think that CB8 would be in line for that sometime at the beginning of the new year, but uh, the more requests always help. Um, and then uh, lastly, I just wanted to, uh, while I still have a couple seconds left here, uh, the Omicron variant is serious. Uh, the city has a number of resources for 
testing and for vaccination. I know most people on the call have probably gotten their vaccines and probably gotten their, their boosters. If you haven't, the city, uh, there's a way you could sign up to get an appointment. Where they, they, uh, they will come to your home. They will give you the vaccine. They will give you a booster. It's easy. It's free. Testing at city hospitals is fast and free. Uh, you can get a PCR test result within a day, uh, like at Metropolitan Hospital, which I know is in CB11, but it's pretty close. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, now let's go to the Transportation Committee report. Craig and Chuck. Okay, we have we have two items. Uh, I'll take the I'll take the first item, and then I think Craig can do the second item. The first item was a request by a building at 205 East 92nd Street, the East, for a no parking sign in front of their building. And um, their concern was that uh, the street is sort of banked down from third to second and they're speeding there and it's a dangerous thing when people try to get in and out, et cetera. We, we, uh, we, we had a lot of, we had discussion about this and our policy has been, I think as a lot of the members know that we, we don't uh, approve these kinds of uh, requests because it, it, it would lead to uh, an avalanche of requests and, and a loss of a lot of parking in the district. We had a robust discussion about this and some people thought we ought to reconsider that and uh, that we ought to look at, uh, look at some special circumstances. In the end, however, we, we voted to disapprove the request uh, six three and uh, with a couple of abstentions, and, and that was the that was really the discussion that we had. And I think it's something we also said that we were going to take a look in the new year at the situation and see if it warranted any kind of a change in our policy. And I think Craig and I are both committed to do that. Um, questions, of course, Tricia. I see. Why don't we unmute Tricia Shimamura? Hi, everybody. I don't abstain frequently. I can think of maybe on one hand how many times I've done it, but I, I am abstaining in this vote um, for a lot of the reasons that uh, Chuck just discussed. I, the conversation was excellent. The points made on both sides were strong. I think at the end of the day that we need a comprehensive kind of thought process or plan for how we want to deal with these requests. I recognize that they are real and I think that we should be addressing them, but I think that Craig mentioned some ideas that are really interesting in terms of how we might be able to handle this. We should be thinking about all of the requests that are coming in or will be coming in. And I just don't want to do an ad hoc sort of like as they come up sort of decision on this. I'd rather us be strategic and thoughtful and, and more comprehensive with it. So I just felt like I should explain my abstention. I really appreciate the chairs of the discussion that the committee had, and I look forward to working with you on this in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, Michelle Birnbaum, why don't we? Um, yeah, I, I would. Yes, thank you. I just want to clarify um, the fact that we sort of have a general precedent for these um, applications does not in any way imply that we don't take each one up with very serious discussion and serious consideration. And that's exactly what happened with this proposal, we talked about it for a very long time and we heard people on both sides. I contend that if we get any more rigid about this, that in fact will stifle discussion. So just because we have sort of um, uh, an unwritten precedent does not in any way mean that we don't give each application for each of these, each request that we don't give it, um, you know, due discussion and due clarification and due consideration. So, and that was done at this time. So this was not done because the committee had a precedent about it. There was thorough discussion and there will be going forward. And I think that I'm happy to have the discussion about a more rigid precedent, but I caution that that might stifle discussion and stifle the acceptance to the rules. So I caution you against that, but having that's not up tonight, but what is, is this particular request. And I think that the um, committee made a wise decision in turning it down. 
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Mrs. Brown, and we unmute Mrs. Brown. Uh, you're skipping Rit and oh, oh, oh sorry. I didn't see Rit. Sorry, Rit. <laughs> Why don't we unmute Rit? All right. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so, look, I have uh, I dissented from this vote. I think the committee has made a grave error, and I think the community board would make a grave error to reinforce the committee's error. Um, with all due respect to Michelle, I disagree. I think the bulk of the conversation, which was long at the transportation committee, um, can you all hear me? Yeah, uh, focused on focused on the general and the fear of uh, the rampant requests that were posited uh, along these lines rather than anything on the specifics of this. Uh, so I don't think that was the case. I, I, I think we are hewing to a general concern to protect on-street parking at the expense of these other potential uses. I think that's a misplaced policy. I think the specifics of this proposal were actually quite strong. In fact, I think the borough commissioner made a mistake in considering it a quality of life request. I think it should have been approved as a safety uh, request um, and not actually gone before the community board. But I think the, the real issues that the uh, petitioners who did a really impressive job of getting support from the building of articulating a specific case uh, I think it was actually a very strong specific proposal, given the, the, the angle of the street and the danger that um, it requires uh, the residents to, to experience. I think this policy and the, the general predilection is quite wrong. Um, the concern that we've heard is that everyone will want this. And I think that actually speaks to the purpose of the community board, which is to figure out what all of our neighbors need and want and find a way to, to address it. Uh, I think the idea that we are somehow in need of protecting on-street parking and any parking space we lose is a terrible loss, I think is highly misplaced. Um, I don't think that parking is a necessity. I think the majority, I know the majority of the residents of Community Board 8 live without a car and do okay. And I think when we are balancing, it doesn't mean we need to get rid of all parking intentionally, but I think when there are other important uses of the curbside, we have to take them into account. And where you have a large building with 100 or 200 families who are coming in and out of the space, that is a much more valuable use of that curb than to have one or two people get parking for their car. Further, I think actually this approach contributes to the delegitimization of the community board. I think the idea that we have a, a, we do have a fairly rigid policy, it seems, it was expressed as a precedent. Quite, it sounds bureaucratic. It didn't seem like we really were thinking, oh, this is a unique case. I'd like to, to I don't think, in fact, there was discussion about the fact that there have not been approvals of this kind of request. And that strikes me as a bureaucratic policy and one that ignores the voices of residents as opposed to an approach that actually thinks about what our neighbors uh, whom we're supposed to represent want. And again, I think we have an unrepresentative uh, aspect to this where we are privileging the concerns of, a, of those who park on the street over the broader public. And I fear that that actually undermines the community board's legitimacy. Finally, we've had an approach that said, uh, we had a discussion that said, and, and I agree with Chuck, I think this, this position needs to be reconsidered. I think in fact, doing everything on an ad hoc basis is not a good idea, but I don't think it's the right approach for us to ask these folks to suffer a rejection of their proposal while we take an undefined amount of time to figure out what we actually think the right answer ought to be from a policy perspective. So I will be voting no on this. I think the committee made a mistake and I encourage all of you to reject the committee's error. Well, let's say, let me just say on behalf of the committee, I appreciate Rick's comments, but um, looking at this historically, look, there has been, we've taken away parking in a number of uh, instances and for institutions, we do it. There's all kinds of situations where we have, and obviously parking's been taken away from with the, the bike, the city bike uh, stations, and there's a whole bunch of other things. And I don't own a car, so I'm not, I'm certainly not a car enthusiast. In fact, I'm an environmental lawyer. I can make a strong case for 
having a lot fewer cars in Manhattan. But it's, uh, I think we always have to be careful, in my view, when we talk about the public that the community board has represented. You have one building that came before us, and if, if it got around broadly, even though it was posted, if it got around broadly, that we were going to put a, a no parking zone in front of that, I think you would have seen a lot more people from around the community um, who appeared against it. And even, and even then there were some people against it because I think that the, the right way to proceed as the committee decided was to uh, you know, not approve this application because, but enter into a serious discussion about whether times have changed and we ought to have a policy that's different than we have it now. I think that's an important and thoughtful approach, but I don't know that that means we, and the committee obviously voted not to uh, go and approve this particular request uh, while we're doing that, because I think, uh, and, I, and, I, and my own, and I, and I think that makes sense and I, from the committee's point of view and from the board's point of view. <clears throat> Mrs. Brown? Let me unmute Mrs. Brown. Yes, good evening, everyone. I feel that the committee made a mistake in their decision. There were 237 apartments at 205 East 92nd Street. And this is a unique case. It is a safety issue. I, as a resident of 205 East 92nd Street, and I use a rollator, and I have difficulty in getting into accessorized or car service. There are other residents in the building who are in wheelchairs and they have difficulty. They have to go down the block in order to ac access their vehicle. It's a real problem. I'm noticing it throughout our community that it's becoming more and more difficult for someone with disabilities to either cross the street or to access a vehicle, or more importantly, a bus. There are vehicles that are now parked three lanes, not double parked, triple parked. And it's a real, real problem. I think this needs to be revisited. It is a safety issue. All they're asking for is one um, spot uh, for access to an accessory ride or a car service. They're not, ask, not asking for two vehicle lengths. They're asking for one. And I'm asking the board um, to not approve um, not support this res resolution. I'm very emotional about this because I find it difficult more and more in each and every day just to walk around the city to get from point A to point B. And I don't think we need to use a broad brush. We need to look at situations on an as requested basis. This needs to be reconsidered. It is a safety issue and we really need to look at our policy. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Um, what, one other thing I'd like to point out and no parking zone actually in front of the building would not mean that other cars might not park there because obviously someone with a handicap uh, permit could park there. Other people with permits could park there. And, and so you wouldn't necessarily solve the situation. There are other things maybe look at whether you want speed bumps in the street. We talked about that, but I think we're getting a little further afield, but I just wanted to make that uh, for the record. Um, Can I just add to what you're saying? <clears throat> so one, one of the things that as a committee we're gonna be dealing with and in January, in fact, we're gonna be talking about um, 
as one of our items is the idea of neighborhood loading zones. DOT has come up with a proposal for 37 neighborhood loading zones. And this discussion fits into that because those loading zones are meant to be 15 minutes in duration um, for ex expeditious loading and unloading of whether it be passengers or deliveries or whatnot. So one of the things that I think we were looking to talk about as a committee was this, the, the broader discussion of how do we deal with requests such as this and thinking about how we can accommodate loading zones and such and how the two um, different policies could come together. So it's really a broader discussion that really encompasses all these different pieces. And I think that's how, as, as Chuck was saying, a no parking um, sign, signage in front of a building won't solve the issue because you could have vehicles that could actually park there illegally in a no parking zone. How, the question is, if we want to accommodate the uses of that space, such as what Mrs. Brown is suggesting, we may need to look at other options such as neighborhood loading zone type of solution. So again, that's why I think this is a broader discussion that we are looking to have. And I think in January is going to be on our agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, let's see, I'm not sure who in what the uh, order they were. Uh, I see Russell, Billy, and then Rebecca uh, Dangor. Yeah, okay, Russell, okay, great. Russell, yes. Has, <clears throat> so I, I voted against this resolution in the committee um, <clears throat> I think Mrs. Brown spoke very eloquently to the safety and accessibility concerns. Um, you know, my inclination was just to support something that a uh, majority of the residents of this particular building requested for their own building. And, um, you know, on that basis, I, I think uh, it's a good thing to do. And um, I think uh, I'm sensible to the concern about, uh, you know, a precedent that this might set, but I mean, my thinking is it's not really going to be that common for, uh, you know, a majority of residents of a particular building to get together and request this, and some buildings may want it, and some may not, and Chuck's laughing, so look, maybe I'm wrong at, about that, but um, in any event, I wasn't as concerned about uh, that uh, precedent that it might set as uh, some others, obviously, and then... Um, that's what I'll just make is as somebody who sometimes drives a car, uh, you know, my preference would not be to have a large building like this essentially, you know, have a say, well, anyone who's getting in and out in front of the building is going to have to double park on this street. You know, I would rather uh, allow them to have their uh, no parking zone that they're asking and ensure that uh, that kind of double parking isn't going to be necessary on a regular basis and, uh, you know, move the traffic along a little more. So, Anyway, those are my, uh, that's why I voted the way I did. Thank you, Russell. Uh, Billy? Oh, yeah. Hey, going? everybody. Yep, uh, I'm unmuted. So um, I'm a member of the Transportation Committee. I had to miss this meeting for a, a family conflict, but um, had I heard the discussion, I would have voted um, in favor of the no parking request. And I want to urge us all to um, vote against what I believe is the resolution that was passed the Transportation and I hope eventually support a resolution to uh, support the building's request for a couple of reasons. One, you know, what happens if we refuse to act on this request? A safety condition, uh, a danger, perhaps in front of this building that's been described to us will persist. And DOT from reading the resolution will say that they can't act without the community board's approval because of it being a quality of life issue. And whether that's an accurate way to, for them to characterize it or not, it put, sort of puts us in this loop of having no action for the building until we're willing to act as a community board. We should have a rigorous process and some standards for how we evaluate these types of requests. There's no doubt about it. But my question is how many months will pass by without such a process being put in place and with the majority of residents in this building demanding uh, a no parking treatment in front of the building? So I think given the safety concerns, I think given that this is a building with 237 apartments, as Mrs. Brown said, and a majority of residents who have signed this petition, I think we could pass a resolution tonight saying, make this no parking. And the resolution can set our own standard, which is that when a building presents a petition with a majority of residents saying they want no parking, we will take it up at the transportation committee. If it results in a flood of uh, requests, then I'm sure we will act very urgently to put in a standard 
uh, Chuck and Craig, that helps us manage those requests. But in the meantime, as a member of the Transportation Committee, I'm willing and able to meet a little bit longer if it takes that time to go through these requests. My hope would be that where a majority of a building makes the request for no parking, that we could get through it relatively swiftly. Um, and lastly, I think, you know, in the minutes note that some folks felt one reason not to support the request is the lack of parking. And I just want to express my view that I don't think that is um, a particularly strong reason uh, to oppose these requests. As the resolution and minutes note, there's a need for a lot of alternative uses of the curbside, whether it's trash, whether it's loading and unloading zones, whether it's for higher vehicles, whether it's room for an accessory ride to pull up, as some folks have described already. So I, I don't think that's a particularly strong reason. So I hope we will um, consider tonight supporting a resolution as a full board to grant the request for no parking. We can lay out our standards going forward, maybe something temporary about a majority of the uh, uh, signatories in the building. Um, and then we can act quickly to put the standards in place. But I hope we won't let this safety condition uh, persist. Thank you. Well, let me just say in response to Billy that I, I, I believe that's absolutely the wrong way to go about it. We have a transportation committee. We have a, we have a situation where we the solution, we, we shouldn't be coming up with solutions at the full board and say, this is our policy now. We should do it after some study and some look at it. And this solution does not guarantee that their problem is gonna be solved. And so I uh, listen, the board obviously will do what it wants to do. And, uh, but I think, I think it'd be a big mistake to come and say, well, let's just set a temporary policy and, and I would be very surprised, frankly, if, any, if most buildings on the Upper East Side, if they really knew all they had to do was get a petition saying we have a problem and a safety condition, could not get that kind of position, petition. Valerie? Can you unmute Valerie? Thanks. Um, hi, I, I wanted to follow up because um, I don't think we've actually in the time that I've been on the transportation committee and now I know when I came late to this meeting while it was white was still going on. Um, I, I, I don't think we've actually had a lot of these requests in the time I've been on transportation. But I do want to go back to one Chuck and, and Craig that I think we did approve. Um, either it was a no standing or no parking in front of the building that was on Fifth Avenue, close to 60th Street. And um, I think the same argument was made that the residents didn't have any place to get in and out and it was unsafe for them to come out of their building. It might have been in 2018, I think. Um, I mean, we can go back and take a look at it. But I don't, I guess I'm wondering whether, I mean, I, I listen with great empathy to Mrs. Brown and, and also, you know, what Billy was saying about these other people, but isn't it possible that this would be revocable? Oh, you started it? Isn't this possible that this would be revocable in any event? So even if we approve this particular request, we could still go forward and try to develop a policy in conjunction with what Craig is saying about, um, you know, overall loading zones and unloading zones, but I think we should at least give these people the benefit of the doubt and um, and vote yes on this. Um, and I'm, I'm asking two questions because I think any no parking sign is or no parking zone is still revocable. So if we, we grant, if we went ahead and approve this, and you know they might have by the time they get it, we would go through the whole loading and unloading, and then have more of a policy. But I don't, given given the concerns and how many people actually live at this building, I think it would be, uh, I don't think it's a good idea, quite frankly, to be against it in this particular circumstance. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, Sharon, I actually I accidentally put down Rebecca's hand um, oh. before Valerie, so. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Rebecca. Uh, that's on us. Rebecca Dangor, yes. No worries. Uh, I'm going to make a substitute motion, and then I'd like to speak on it, if possible, if there's a second, which would be to approve the proposal. Is there a second? Yes, I think Billy. I saw Rita and Billy. Yeah, go ahead. Billy seconded. Um, I 
of course, understand all of the concerns about precedent. And I feel awkward raising this since I missed, I couldn't attend the meeting. However, I do think everything I saw in when I rewatched the meeting and even in the minutes, this is a very clear safety issue. And I don't think acting when safety is at stake uh, means we have to approve every other request that's similar. I think this is a, as we heard from Mrs. Brown, this is a, a very serious um, situation. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, not acting. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So is, is your, just let me make sure we're clear, is your substitute to support a no parking or is it for something else given that we were talking about the limitations it, of no parking? It, um, I think this, I will be very open to friendly amendments. I think the simplest starting point would be to approve what they ask for, which is the no parking. Um, I am interested if possible in, if Valerie wanted to make a friendly um, amendment that, uh, uh, would go along with what she was talking about in terms of a time limit to see if this actually helps or not. But um, I think everything we've heard at least so far ha has been um, in support of this request, so. Okay, all right. Further discussion here, let's see, Sharon, we- Go ahead and unmute. Uh, unmute Sharon. Thank you. Um, also, I would like to uh, begin by thanking uh, Craig as well as Chuck um, over the years in uh, chairing the Transportation Committee. You have had, and um, both of you have had to, to manage and, and navigate uh, competing interest and uh, you've done so, I think, with um, a great deal of compassion as well as empathy um, and a, a very real uh, uh, a sense of, of what the uh, community wants. And um, I appreciate that uh, not only about you, uh, Chuck and Craig, um, but also uh, the Transportation Committee as a whole. And I appreciate that and, and notice that because I've always advocated that uh, cycling, that driving and walking or complementary modes of, of transport of tra or, or complementary modes of transportation. Uh, with that said, I very much have to support uh, Rebecca's uh, substitute motion and uh, thank you for uh, proposing that. It's, uh, for me, it's a matter of not, not just about safety, and uh, that's reason enough, I know, for most people, but for if, well, if, if there is an apartment building um, in particular that is interested, I, I support as well on um, Billy's comments. Uh, if there is an apartment building that is interested in having a, a no parking sign, you know what I say, let's go for it. It is one parking spot overall, you know. And lastly, thank you, Mrs. Brown, for your comments. I'll have to tell you, it wasn't until my mother needed a rollator that I actually knew what a rollator was. And it's absolutely uh, essential, critical that uh, those individuals that do have uh, challenges uh, walking or stepping off a curb or onto uh, the sidewalk, that it, to the extent that uh, we can create uh, an urban environment to make that as easy as possible, we certainly should, because at the end of the day, all 51 of us on this community board, we're, we're, we're citizen planners, we're citizen urban planners, and we, we can think outside of the box 
And um, I want to conclude by uh, reiterating that I very much support the substitute motion. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm hoping that the uh, community board will also support the substitute motion and also appreciate uh, the leadership of Chuck as well as Craig. Uh, although I'm not uh, supporting what came out of the committee this time, I have supported 99.9% of what of, of the committee's work in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Elaine Walsh, can we unmute Elaine? Skipped over Alita and oh, then I didn't, Elaine. Uh, I thought Elaine had her hand up first, but maybe I'm wrong. Just in the order that they're they are on the screen. But okay. All right, Alita. Thank you. Um, I just, I found Mrs. Brown's uh, comments to be very compelling. Um, I just also wanted to mention that not everyone who has a car is a resident of CBA. There are people who work as doormen or maybe in grocery stores. There are small businesses that rely on people being able to park quickly and run in for something. So um, vilifying people in CBA who drive is not the solution to this, which leads me to this, and I'll be very brief because it's not really directed to the motion, is that there are so many competing uses of the roadway and the sidewalk that maybe maybe the committee could look at um, some kind of um, meeting to address all of that and come up with some kind of plan to, to look at and um, evaluate all of the competing uses and have a system that makes sense because um, willy, willy nilly, and I'm not suggesting that this is, and I don't really mean that, but just the putting band-aids on the solutions and then hoping that one band-aid is not sticking onto another wound is not necessarily the answer. So I guess I'd like to see something where we're looking at taking a comprehensive view of what's going on in an increasingly crowded community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Elaine Walsh. Thank you. This is a very complicated issue. And I agree with Chuck that this really shouldn't be having a long-term discussion at a full board meeting. There are many complications to what is before us and many unintended consequences. We are going to and are seeing huge tall buildings being built. If you don't think that any of them are gonna come in now and want a parking space in front of them or a cut in front of them, and we have rules on that also, you have to be kidding yourself. I have to say my partner has been disabled for years and I deal with a wheelchair all the time. And I live on 79th street. We manage, not easily, but we respect what has to get done. Our community has the largest elderly population in the city of New York. I'm not sure from a disability point what the numbers are, but if we move to allow a no parking space in front of that building, and that's not the largest building around, everyone, including myself, will come before the board for a space in front of my building, as will every other apartment building on the avenues, on the wide streets, et cetera. Thank God we have R8B, so that'll keep it a little small, but if they have somebody disabled, then they will be coming in. And you're not saying it's for the disabled. You're saying for people who want the convenience of being able to walk out the door and get into a facility, um, a cab or a car or whatever. Now, some will have baby carriages that was pointed out that they got to put the baby in the car seat. We understand that. But right down, let me see, west, east of that doorway is an area that you can park in. I think it was no standing. I can't remember, Chuck and Craig, but it was stated that, excuse me, that there was a space there. And I do believe that the building wasn't asking for just one space. 
but for two spaces. And I think that to move forward right now, it's not appropriate. I will vote to oppose the, um, the first, the sub no, I'm opposing the substitute. I'm supporting the initial. There are too many, too many unknowns in doing this. And I'm going to suggest if there's such a concern, then the community board needs to take more action to limit the size of buildings in the neighborhood. Because every tall building is going to have 200 and some odd people living there. And I don't understand why the developer, when they proposed it, didn't plan ahead but now leaves it on the backs of the people who live in that building to do it. I'm just very angry about the whole thing. Would I love a space in front of me? Absolutely. Would I be guaranteed access to that space all the time? No. And by the way, I do own a car. Thank you. Um, okay, taking those who spoke first, who, who haven't spoken rather before, Peter Pat would be next. Peter, let me unmute Peter. I Sorry. got unmuted. Here no, go. no, no, real quick. Peter, um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was very much moved by Mrs. Brown's comments and I strongly support them. I do see it, number one, as a safety issue. I see it as a concern with regard to seniors and, and disability. Um, the notion that one, I, I have a car. I consider a car, and my th thinking has evolved just in the course of the conversation, but a car in New York City is a luxury. It's not particularly economic, it's not a necessity, um, and, and, and frankly, it's not particularly environmentally friendly. So I think the notion, if we're supposed to represent the community, to have 237 people or a majority of them interested in one to two spaces, one to two car spaces, that is not, to me, a large amount to sacrifice in order to provide both convenience, but more importantly, safety to the people in that building. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Paul Crickler, our newest board member. Welcome, Paul. I know he's been at the committee, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess this is my maiden speech. Um, I strongly support the proposal, the alternate proposal. And I, I'll just say I completely agree with what Ritz said with Billy, Rebecca, Sharon. So I won't repeat all that stuff. I promise you. Just two points I want to make. We're supposed to represent the community. 80% of our community does not own a car. And the, the comments before about the, the equation here, we're actually giving up our safety for 200 people for two car spaces. It's the wrong way around right now. I actually rode my bike down that street today. I used to live about a block away from there for about 10 years. I've, I've walked up and down that street and ridden by, by, rode my dad my bike down that street hundreds of times. It's terrifying. I know exactly where the doorway is. You can get up to three, two car parked and a van parked and you're squeezing through and there are poor people trying to get into their cars if they're disabled. It's terrifying. The cars scream down there. So two points, it's really about safety. It's not just a notion, it's terrifying there. And also we should represent our community. We should be having less uh, space given up for car storage is free at the expense of something as obvious as safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Elizabeth Rose, next, I believe. Um, I hate these kinds of issues because this is one where on the very individual level, there is no question that they have a very strong perceived need. And I can't agree or disagree with the safety questions here um, because I was not at the committee meeting and you know don't have that you know feel or flavor for is this safety specific to this location or is this um, safety the kind of safety issue that we would see in many locations and there are many buildings with 200 apartments. And I even ask the one wonder the question, just do we even know how many buildings there are in, with 200 apartments? So I do think that there are equity and unintended con 
consequences, implications of this that need to be thought through before we can approve this. Um, because it is very difficult. I mean, if we philosophically want to make the choice that you know, we should be reserving the public space of the streets for, you know, hum for people who are walking or accessing uh, as opposed to other things. That's a policy decision that has multiple implications. Um, if we choose to uh, provide this no parking space to the residents of this building, that is a decision that has potential consequences and multiple equity issues, you know, from other buildings who want to do the same thing. Um, and when we started open restaurants, there was a lot of discussion around, well, shouldn't the community board review every application? And I was a staunch believer at that time that no, we shouldn't pick the winners and the losers, that there should be a set of criteria and the criteria are met or not. Um, and I think this kind of thing, there are so many equity issues and so many unintended consequence issues that we need to take the time to think those through. And I really appreciate Craig mentioning uh, the loading zone idea that there may be other solutions to the challenge that could be applied more broadly than a you know, very specific action for one specific building. And we don't know how many other buildings there are that will want the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make a suggestion. I'm not trying to, uh, but based on the discussions, obviously people feel there's, you know, that we should not reject the building, but I'd like to, I'd like to uh, take it back into our committee and look at this again and look at it from all sides and come up with a decision and, and that would then come that would then come back to the full board. We could do that in January and we wouldn't be obviously we wouldn't be um, rejecting it or we wouldn't be approving it, but we'd uh, discuss it and, and look at some of the look at look at uh, some of the the issues that are involved. And, uh, and I think we might be able to come up with a, a good solution to the problem. And I, I certainly would, you know, have an open mind as to how we should deal with it. But that, that to my mind, and that's obviously up to the board, would be the best way to really deal with this particular issue where we give the committee a chance to look more broadly at it, but we're not really rejecting their request. So I just, uh, I don't know whether that's something that, uh, you know, that Rebecca and others who were uh, made a motion to approve it would go along with, but I just play that, play that uh, before the board. Should we ask Rebecca her thoughts now, since she made the substitute resolution? Rebecca, yeah. I am not going to lie. I did consider tabling <laughs> instead of making an alternate mo uh, motion. Not I leave it up to for an actual meeting uh, we're going to have in January, right? So a set date when it will be rediscussed. Yes. Uh, so it's okay with me, but I leave it up to the board. I just didn't want there to be a vote um, in support uh, against this. So is that, is that a motion to table or what, what are we doing? I made the... Uh, substitute motion so I think it's better if someone else makes a motion to table if that's what the board wants to do otherwise we can vote on uh, my substitute motion can the chair make a motion to table Chuck, can you make a motion to table well I don't want to make I, I don't want to do that I would rather someone if you know I'm, I'm making a suggestion and if people there's a bunch of there's a bunch of thumbs up so if that's a if that's a privileged motion then I think Is that uh, as with them, uh, Vanessa, Barry, uh, so Billy, Michelle? So that okay with these are all thumbs up for motions to table essentially. So I think it's if it's a, okay. a privileged motion, we can consider it a second. 
So can we just take it back to the committee and we'll come back in January? With, uh, I think some we have to vote on the motion to the table. Then. Okay. Okay. Uh, th then I'll clear all the feedback, all the uh, hands, and then we will have one of the secretaries confirm the motion to table or the vote to table. Billy, is that you? Yes. Okay, somebody would have been call roll. So I guess if we're doing the usual, if you're voting no abstaining or not voting for calls on the motion to table. Is that yes. right? Okay. If you're voting against the motion to table or abstaining or not voting for cause, please raise your hand. Um, Barbara Rudder. Barbara, on mute. I'm voting against, uh, voting no against tabling. We had. Carolina. Carolina Tejo. If you were speaking, we could not hear you. He's muted now. Okay. Um, you want, should we go to Sharon Pope Marshall? Yeah. I'm voting now against tabling. Carolina, you're unmuted, but just chat me and I'll read it to the record. No to tabling for Ter Carolina Tejo. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to raise your hand? Okay, seeing no other hands, the motion to table passes. Thank you. This will be taken up. This will be taken up in yeah. January. And I appreciate the board's uh, willingness to uh, let the committee take a look at this again, and we will really look at it and and, and come back with what we hope is a really a good resolution of this. Let me turn it over to. Craig for somewhat less contentious. So. Before, well, we hope, but before moving to the next item, I just want Gail Brewers here. So I just want to give her the opportunity to give her report if she would like to. Sure. That's, that's very nice of you, but this is a fabulous conversation. I love it. This is my kind. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Board 8. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I've been talking for months about this public realm czar, somebody to help all of us figure out what should be in the streets. So I think this is the best example. And I hope that when you're having your del deliberations in the transportation committee, you, you could think of what a public realm czar might do. Somebody who can think about this very complicated issue. So add it to your list, Chuck. Um, just a few things. First of all, everybody who came to our Manhattan reception at John Jay College on Sunday, thank you very much. We had about 800 people. And I deeply appreciate your support. Second, I just, we're still focused on transportation and this issue of congestion pricing is gonna pop up. We're just all of a sudden going to see it. I have a feeling. So again, another transportation issue. Um, I don't know whom the governor is going to put on the committee that's going to be deciding the congestion pricing traffic mobility review board. But um, we are pushing, as you know, um, to have a Manhattan voice, Christine Berthold from uh, Board 4 is the one that I think most of us are hoping gets on that board. But I do think all, all has to be focused on that because we're going to be swamped with issues. Um, in terms of open restaurants, we did have a discussion in our Tuesday at 3 a couple of weeks ago, and it was hugely uh, populated by people with lots of comments. And then tomorrow, I know that, uh, I'm sorry, on Friday when we have the uh, the borough service cabinet with all of the district managers, again, the open restaurants folks from DOT are going to give a presentation. So I assume that your wonderful uh, district manager will bring you up to date. But certainly the boards have been phenomenal in what they have suggested. And I think that's the reason that the DOT slowed down that they have a survey, which you know about. Um, we are uh, knowing that uh, Mark Levine will do a great job, but we are uh, hoping that you will send letters of intent, the nonprofits who want capital funding. That's going to be due, due uh, January 14th. Um, you'll be on the borough president's website just to submit intent to uh, participate in the capital budget process for your organization. Um, our last Manhattan.
Patent Recovery and Reopening Task Force. This is the task force this Tuesday at three is going to be on Tuesday, December 21st. And the topic is going to be workforce, which of course was front page of the Times yesterday because uh, Manhattan, New York City in general are not doing well. And rest of the country is about 4% unemployment and the city is at 9.4%. So that's a big, a big difference and we do need to address it. Um, I also wanna mention that um, and just in terms of uh, the borough board is tomorrow at 8.30 as we know, and we'll be talking about 175 Park Avenue and certainly the Commodore, or also known as the hotel, uh, right next door to the Grand Central Station, and 495 11th Avenue, also known as Slaughterhouse. So there are quite a few topics in terms of ULURPS, as well as the Central Park Exonerated Five Memorial. So it will be a very busy borough board. I think that's it. And I just want to say thank you very much to Board 8. I know that. Um, one way or another, we'll still be talking in the next couple of years, but you have been a phenomenal support, and I hope we've been able to give you what you needed in terms of support. Thank you very much, and happy holidays to Board 8. Thank you. Thank you uh, I wanted just to uh, let you know, Gail, we, we do, uh, coming up, there's uh, in the congestion pricing task force report, there is a resolution to support the appointment of Christine Bertet to the uh, Transportation Mobility Review Board. Uh, I also want to say thank you, Gail, for um, the terrific reception on Sunday, um, and just more broadly, since uh, this is our last full board meeting of the year and our last full board meeting of your tenure as borough president, I do want to say thank you very much on behalf of the board for eight excellent years. And uh, you know, I think community board members certainly are are conscious of uh, all that you do in the uh, <clears throat> in in with regard to community boards, not least because you uh, appoint most of us, um, but uh, you know, I think uh, not everybody in the public appreciates uh, or, or may be aware of how much support we get from the borough president's office. And um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, every member of the board appreciates how closely um, the, the board and the board uh, staff work with the borough president and the borough president staff and um, they really have been tremendous and you've been a tremendous partner for uh, for all this time. So I do want to say thank you uh, very much. And uh, we know that you're not going far, you'll be across town, uh, but uh, we will miss you as, uh, as our borough president. Thank you very much. You're here. All right. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead here with the transportation committee. Great, thank you, and thank you, um, Borough President Burr, um, on behalf of all of us, um, and on behalf of transportation, I, I think both Chuck and I could thank you for all the work you've done on that important topic. Absolutely, we agree, you've been great. So the next item, which is going to hopefully be a much quicker and easier discussion, um, was a request for a stop sign at on 78th Street at the intersection with Cherokee Place. So this was a unanimous um, resolution. And in fact, after our discussion, um, right before we took a vote, we realized that we in fact took earlier action about five years ago in October, 2016, um, requesting a stop sign and some traffic calming measures along East 78th Street approaching Cherokee Place. It has been described um, and um, by those who live in the area that is a very dangerous intersection because of oncoming traffic on 78th Street not being aware of the intersection. It's lacking pedestrian amenities. It is not ADA accessible um, and it just presents a lot of safety issues. So the request that was made in 2016 was to support a eastward facing stop sign on 78th Street and to put in whatever traffic calming measures would be appropriate. And we are essentially going to be reiterating that resolution now, which DOT will be willing to reconsider. There, there's actually an ongoing traffic study that involves that area. And there is the possibility that conditions have changed to the extent where they may be able to move forward with it. So obviously with the resolution, I think that would reinforce um, the um, importance of this. Yeah, this was just I just wanted to add this was caught in DOT uh, bureaucracy, frankly, because they said there wasn't 
a place to put a crosswalk so you can have a stop sign. There is now a place to put a crosswalk. And I think we would should be able to get a stop sign and hopefully other things there too. So we're hopeful. The, the timing is everything. All right, um, we have Sharon Pope Marshall and Sharon, please be unmuted. <clears throat> I'd like to call the question, Craig. All right. Great. All in favor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are there any seconds? I see thumbs up. I see a thumbs up from Barry and Rebecca Barber. All right. Um, are there any, um, anyone opposed to calling the question? All right. Let's call the roll. If you would like to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause, Please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, the resolution passes by a vote of 44 to zero to zero to zero. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Um, Craig, I'm gonna say. We're done. Well done, <laughs> basted. <laughs> All right. So uh, Craig will say unmuted and we will unmute Alita um, for them to give us the congestion pricing task force report. And, um, but since you guys want to give a little more time, uh, I won't make a motion. I do think it's important to support Gail's nomination. I think that was Alita. Oh, I see. Alita was listening to the audio of the uh, uh, Yeah, I'm Alita is not unmuted yet. Well, she was the one getting the feedback. She has so. there was a video coming through, so we'll unmute her again. Uh, can I don't you, know how you guys have it divided up, but Craig, if you want to get started, I'm here. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I and I'm I'm sorry. I was trying to find um, Christine Berthe's bio, but yeah, I, Alita, I have it. Up, um, I could I could um, I could read it out loud if if you prefer. Yeah. Good, thank you. All right, okay, well, do you, do you, do you want, want to start? To, we're just doing the resolution, right? Yes. Yeah, so I, we, I, I guess we, we're just doing the resolution. We have a resolution to support Gail Brewer's nominee, Christine Berthe, or Berthet, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, who is in CB4, was the former chair. Craig can read her bio as, uh, as a Manhattan nominee for the, uh, uh, the traffic Review Mobility Board, Mobility Review Board. And at the same time, we reiterated our request that we have two Manhattan representatives, one from the north of 60th Street, which would be us, and one from south of 60th Street, which would be Christine. Um, and so the resolution is to support both Christine's nomination to the uh, TMRB, as well as uh, having two Manhattan representatives. We neglected to attach Christine's bio to our resolution. So we have Craig in his best um, Shakespeare impersonation reading it. Yeah, please don't make me try to speak in an English <laughs> accent. Just trying um, some more. I, I have a hard enough time trying to hide my former Long Island accents when I speak. <laughs> you do a good job. Um, and just a little context for those who haven't been following congestion pricing, the Traffic Mobility Review Board is the panel that is going to be in charge of determining all the policies related to the discounts, exemptions, offsets and credits for um, um, among the different groups and populations that maybe that would otherwise be charged for um, the congestion pricing fee. And I believe they will also be determining the ultimate pricing structure and of a total structure of in terms of prices charged um, for congestion pricing for crossing below 60th Street. But ultimately, Oh, I'm sorry, Craig. No, no, no. I said, which is why it's so important that we have this Manhattan representation. And any any rules actually relating to the zone, which is only in Manhattan and only below 60th Street. Um, but the uh, their decisions are ultimately subject to review and acceptance by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. Is that right? Right. But the, the, the kicker is that Ultimately, it is going to be the state that, uh, or the governor that appoints all the members. The rec requirement is that of the six members, one represent New York City, one represents the Long Island Railroad catchment area on Long Island, and one represents the Metro North catchment area north of New York City. 
Um, the other three are at large, but of course, if it's the Tarbo Bridge and Tunnel Authority, which is essentially in charge of congestion pricing, um, they are a state agency overseen by the governor. So um, there so is in that order to have a voice, how independent better, they truly will be. Right, and in order to have a voice, we better have Manhattan representatives on the on the traffic board. Right. So the here's the biography. Christine Berthet is a former chair of Manhattan Community Board 4 and currently serves as co-chair of its transportation committee. She chairs the planning committee of the Hudson Yards Hell's Kitchen Alliance Business Improvement District and is a frequent attendee of the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council. Ms. Berthet is a noted transportation and planning negotiator and has contributed to city, various citywide efforts to improve transportation. She was an early champion of congestion pricing, supporting and ad advocating for Mayor Bloomberg's congestion pricing campaign. She is well respected by the by local uh, elected officials, agency commissioners, and her fellow community board members, even when there are disagreements for her professionalism and knowledge. Fifteen years ago, she co-founded Check Peds, a nonprofit organization to improve safety and reduce traffic congestion on the west side of Manhattan. Check Peds work with New York City DOT, Port Authority, NYPD, and elected officials to redesign the traffic flows on the west side and obtain crucial safety improvements. She has also negotiated with the city for reductions in parking in Hudson Yards and contributed to the mayor's Midtown Citizens Committee tour and charter bus parking initiative. Recently, she produced a study of best practices in the intercity bus industry in the Northeast corridor with Port Authority's input. Most recently, she was one of the architects of the Hell's Kitchen South Coalition Plan, which was instrumental in refocusing and redesigning the Port Authority's plan for the new expanded Port Authority bus terminal. Ms. Berthet campaigned for Idle Free New York to reduce idling and improve air quality, which resulted in state legislation limiting idle time around schools. She also contributed to the 2019 New York City Master Plan legislation to dedicate more street space to pedestrians, cyclists, and bus riders. She is a member of the Empire State Complex Community Advisory Committee's Working Group. Christine lectures at the Earth Institute at Columbia University and trains community board members on transportation planning as part of the Manhattan Borough President's annual training program. She serves on the boards of transportation alternatives and streets block. She is an advisor to the Design Trust for Public Space and the New York City Department of Small Business Services. The services Neighborhood Commons tasked to shape the future of commercial corridors. In her 30 year corporate career, Ms. Berthet has held executive positions in the technology and financial industries, ran technology startups as well as global companies. She started as a systems engineer at IBM after gaining an MBA in organization and strategy from HEC France. She presently works part-time at Sunnyside Records, her family owned independent jazz label. Thank you, thank you. And there is a time, this is time sensitive because we don't know when things are happening and there seems to be a sense that we need to have this uh, recommendation come now rather than waiting until another meeting in January. Um, let's go to the board members, Sharon, Rebecca, and then Billy. Sharon? I'd like to call a question. Are there any objections to calling the question? Is that Rebecca is waving her hand frantically. She's objecting. Or are you seconding, seconding. objecting? No, I'm objecting. You did look a little frantic there waving, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, no, I was objecting. I just wanted it because you didn't mention that the additional part of the resolution was calling for there to be an additional representative of Manhattan from above 60th Street. I did, but that's okay. I must have gotten lost in all of my other comments, but I'm glad you brought it up again. Thank you. Thank you. So there are two parts to the resolution. One is to support uh, Christine Berthet, Berthet, and the other is to support another member of the um, the Transit Mobility Review Board from north of 60th Street. Are there any other? We're calling the question for a second. Okay. So then would one of the secretaries call the roll? I'll do that. Whose turn it is. Yep, it, it, it is my turn, I think, unless I'm mistaken. Um, all right, so please um, raise your hand if you are voting no, abstaining, or not voting for cause. Uh, Rebecca Lamort. Uh, my hand was still raised because I had a question about this woman hearing her background uh, involving Hudson Yards and the far west side raises some concern for me. 
knowing what has happened there with the public subsidy spend, the fact that they only got an ADA accessible station because Steve Ross was building there. So I have apprehensions and I would like to know more about what this woman did before moving forward on a number of these fronts. So I would ask that we table this until we can get some more answers on her. We've already called to question, Rebecca. I believe we can't. I know I had my hand raised though, so it's unfortunate. So uh, I'll be abstaining from this vote then. Thank you. Sorry. Valerie? Well, to Rebecca's point, can we make a substitute motion? Not during voting. Okay, well then I vote no. Okay, well, well, we're not up to that yet. Um, Billy, are you calling the roll now? This is, I think this is a voting. Okay, this is for voting. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You're voting. So I, I've marked Valerie down as a no, and we'll come back to uh, Rebecca. Um, Carolina? I think Rebecca abstained. She did. She did. Oh, did she? Okay. Thank you. Carolina? Oh, your, your sound is still not working. You're unmuted, but we cannot hear you. So put it in the chat, please. While Move she does that, could we go to Michelle and then come back yep. to Carolina's comments? Yep. Abstain. Michelle, thank you. Michelle abstains. Um, next up is uh, Abraham Salcedo. I would also like to abstain. Okay, thank you, Abraham. Next, Lowell Barton. I would also like to abstain. Thank you, Lowell. Uh, Sarah Chu. I abstain. Thank you, Sarah. And Tejo's vote was no. Okay, thank you. Andrea has her hand raised, Billy. Yep. Abstaining. Yeah. Abstain. Thank you, Sandrea. Greg Morris. Abstain. Thank you, Greg. Uh, May, you're up next. Abstaining. Okay, thank you, May. Um, anyone else want to raise your hand? Uh, abstaining, not voting for cause or voting no? Okay, seeing no other hands, I'll go tally the vote, but the resolution passes. Thank you, Billy. And that was all that we had. So thank you very much, everyone. Happy holidays. Thanks, Craig. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next, let's go to the Street Life Committee report and Abraham. Okay, hello everyone, good evening. Um, for Street Life, we had uh, five unanimous approvals. Um, I omitted 3A, which was also uh, voted on. Um, do I have hands to take, take them all together? Uh, Ed, okay. Is that what you're Ed? doing? Yep. Can we move to take them all together? Great. Do we have a second on that? Okay, great. Uh, if uh, you'd like to vote. Perfect. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> if you'd like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, the street light, those items uh, passed unanimously with a vote of 44 to zero to zero. All right. Okay, that's it for yeah, the right. committee reports. Um, so, um, old business. Uh, I'm just going to briefly mention here. Um, that uh, you know, I, I thank Ben. Uh, sorry, thanks. Yeah, Laura for her uh, eight years of service. And also, just wanted to recognize and thank um, Councilmember Ben Kalos for his eight years of uh, service as one of our uh, council members. Uh, and someone else who has worked very closely with the board over the years and worked very hard. And uh, is somebody who uh, also has uh, appointed many of the members on the board. So um, I did just want to make sure that yeah, this is. Uh, uh, our last full board member in his tenure. So I did want to thank him for uh, for all that he has done over the years. 
Um, Barbara, you have um, an item of old business. Okay, I have one old business and two new business, so I'm going to take them all together. The old business, one of the elected officials mentioned um, composting. Uh, the Environment and Sanitation Committee had a, a whole thing on composting that was quite good. I I will tell you what I did. I know that my building is on the waiting list. I actually met with somebody on the board and tried and convinced them by giving them materials and convinced her to convince the boy, boards to do it. I really think it's very important for our environment, for the lack of garbage and so on. Can, we, can you can we do that in the Environment and Sanitation Committee? Can we take we that We did it already. Do you want to do it again? I just, well, I, just I, I don't yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't want to sort of Okay, I just thought I would ask people to speak to their board or management or whatever. Two new, th two new pieces of business very quickly. There's two things going on that I wish I knew more about and I wish the community board would do it. One was, is redistricting and the other, I guess we have no vote, but I don't think people understand the new vote by the council um, for green card holders to have the, the uh, municipal vote. Um, I'm wondering if the community board, I'm not sure what committee, I think it would be the voting committee, would possibly be interested in hearing it. I would certainly be interested in it because I'm confused by both issues. Okay, we can, okay. Um, all right, let's go to Rebecca for more. It's new business, technically, so let me know if you want me to wait or just no, go. Let's go to the new business, take it away. A new business. I want to flag for everyone here um, a word that was used numerous times tonight that is not the acceptable term for disabled people. The term handicapped is not a term that should be used in resolutions or conversation. And I understand inclusivity is something that we're all continually learning about and we're having these experiences that open us up. But I would like to say that going forward, I'd love to see the board, my fellow board members really dig deep and make an effort to be sensitive with the terms they're using, be it about around disability, around race, around gender, around sexuality, whatever it is. But it came up a number of times tonight. I didn't say anything during the committee process because I wanted to let things move forward. And I think it's more important long term for us to have a reckoning with this, where we are speaking about issues in the way that the communities we're focusing on are comfortable having them spoken about. So going forward, if we can avoid, and not even avoid, if we can completely stop using the term handicapped in our resolutions and in conversation, disabled is the term. And I'm happy to talk to people offline if they have any questions, but I wanted to raise that in new business tonight. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, um, Craig, go ahead. I just want to say for the record that the transportation um, agenda um, resolutions and minutes, I never use the term handicap. So I just want to make sure that everyone is clear about that. We are very sensitive to that and, and do our best to make sure that our language is respectful. All right, Paul. I just want to say thank you to Rebecca for the way you, you put that. Um, I, I, I would never use handicap, but I was very pleased when you, um, the way you said it, it was very nice. Thank you very much for informing us all. Okay, I think that is it for new business. So can we get a motion to adjourn? I see, I see Barry, Michelle. All right, that's a motion and a second. So unless anyone's opposed. We will be adjourned. So everybody have uh, happy holidays and uh, happy new year. And we will see you in January.